See, this is where the words get tricky because modern people tend to think that truth is a set of descriptions of facts. But that's not what the truth is. The truth is, for example, the truth is the process by... The truth is your willingness to... to make manifest the process that enables you to learn and progress. Hmm. Right? That's, that's closer to what the truth constitutes. Ooh! Kind of vibes. <laughs> kind of base. <laughs> Okay, Jordan. Okay, kind of base. Kind of base. A process. That's why the truth is often represented as a spirit, right? Rather than a set of descriptions. This is partly why I take offense, let's say, to some degree when people ask me if I believe in God. It's the same problem. People think of truth as something like fact. Mm. And, and that's not what it is. That's one tiny aspect of what it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's so the first now, thing So you I... said truth, you know, my truth, your truth rather than God's truth. So this idea of the truth will set you free, genuinely, that's why I always say, if God is real, great. If aliens are great, real, great. If magic is real, great. If this is real, great. I don't care. I'm not here to fight the truth. I'm simply here to observe it. And before, and usually, what people do is they decide what's true, and then they find the evidence that makes them feel very solid in that perception. And then, of course, you have to challenge yourself and what you're perceiving when you feel like you have two very let's say, strong voices disagreeing on what they think truth is. See, I learned this partly by being a clinical psychologist. So one of the things I learned from being a clinical psychologist, and also in my own family, was that if, if you have a disagreement with someone and you pretend that you don't, all that happens inevitably is that the disagreement deepens and multiplies and, la and extends over a much longer period of time, even forever. Hmm. Resentment. Yes, that's certainly one of its manifestations. Yes, ab ab well, resentment and lies, you know, mm -hmm. like if, if we're in a relationship and I have to see you every day and there's something you do that annoys me, well, let's, let's take that apart. So there's something you do habitually that annoys me. Okay, there's two possibilities. One is you're annoying. One is I'm, there's something wrong with how I'm looking at it or some intermingling of those. Mm -hmm. Now, I could bring that up. Now, you might say, well, how would I bring that up? And I would say something like, When this happens, I find myself irritated. What do you think about that? And now I have to really want to know because part of me is going to think, well, I'm down, I'm hoping that it's you yeah. that's annoying <laughs> and not me that's stupid. Mm -hmm. But I might be stupid. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to put it out there neutrally. It's like, let's sort this out because I'd rather not be irritated with you. Mm -hmm. And so if you can figure out why I'm blind and you're fine, you tell me and I'll do what I can to sort that out. But if we figure out that you're annoying, then let's see what we can do about that so that I don't have to be annoyed with you every goddamn day for the rest of my life. But you have to really trust that the person who's observing you is observing you without their own personal bias. You know, that's why I really trust my farm brother I trust him so much to observe my behavior outside of my husband because he's incredibly fair and he judges me without his own bias because he knows his own bias. He really does. You know, out of all my siblings, he's the only one I trust to completely view me without bias because as much as he loves me and as much as he's very strong in his Catholicism, he will give me advice or input that is without his own personal bias, without what he wants me to do. Like he knows how to talk to me without, and I would say vice versa. Like I think I'm pretty good at giving him advice that would work better for his bubble and his Catholicism. But for me as a sister, he's the only person in my life um, that I do trust other than my husband to give me completely unbiased opinion. Uh, without in, and without interjecting their own desire for what direction they'd want me to go. I think I have other people in my life that are very good at it on a spectrum at certain times, but everybody has a shortcoming, so no big deal. But sometimes I can't go to all my friends and family because their bias is too strong. And then whether or not they acknowledge that, well, that's their own problem. Go talk to your mom about it. But like, you know, that's why I trust him so much, you know, other than my husband, once again, because obviously now I have him, but I would go to my farm brother and be like, hey, call me out. What am I doing? Because he would tell me and, and it, you know what I'm saying? So you have to really trust that in people as well. 
It's very hard to have that with people, which is why I think conflict arises, which is why there's like a fight, which is why there's a miscommunication. And again, I think one of the things that I've learned is to let go of grudges and don't hold ill thoughts about people, have a principled stance. But I to have a principled stance doesn't mean I have to hate you. And I think that's something I did learn in my in it coming into my 30s. Right. And that's a war. Right. And that's often the sort of war that people don't want to have. And it's certainly the sort of thing they'll turn a blind eye to. But if you have 30 of those things with your wife, you're done. Your yeah. marriage is done. Right. So you're not being well, you're not being is this is uh, who is this? Is this George's girlfriend? I've never watched the George's podcast uh, since he left impulsive uh, enough to know who this girl is honest with one another. And I mean, it's because, well, it's because it's difficult to bring something up to somebody that then they feel like they need to either fix or change. Or as you said, if maybe it's the way that you're perceiving it is wrong, then you need to fix and change mm -hmm. that. And, yeah, and you don't know how deep that goes. Right. You know, that's the other thing. You see this when couples are trying to communicate and often. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, let's say that you are doing something habitual that you don't know about that is actually annoying. Mm. And it's not just annoying, say, to me, but it's annoying to other people. And you really don't know about it. And so I bring it to your attention, and now we have to delve into it. Now, this could easily be reversed, but we'll use this example. Okay, that is George's girlfriend. Okay, thanks, gaming. She's so cute. I love her. We have no idea how deep down into your structure of assumptions we're going to have to go to find out why that's great point happening hmm. and often what what you'll discover is if you do this with people you'll go down the rabbit hole and first to anger because people will get angry and then to tears yep. right yep. and then that often fixes it if you can get to tears mm. the person will have a realization and sometimes a transformation that will go along with that but people don't oh i think i think uh well it depends on the circumstance i've seen a lot of tears move into shutdown I don't like that would they you don't like that would and you no say, wonder definitely and would you say that then it comes back down to both parties being humble in that situation so if i found out that i'm the one being annoying mm -hmm. i need to humble myself and have an open mind to what you have said and realize that okay yeah, i am being annoying and i know it's embarrassing but i need to figure well, it out yes well and also you do that with a certain kind of clear-headed realization like this is the thing that's so you're bound in a marriage let's say now the binding is you don't get to run away like seriously well so then you have a dilemma which is well, you're either going to confront this or you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. Now, that's not wise because if there's something your wife is doing that you don't like, mm. if enough of those things accumulate, you won't like her. Mm -hmm. Well, then that's terrible for her. Yo, I saw um, a video with Dr. Deloney and the guy was like, I don't like my wife. And I was like, bro. Now he married her in the military far away. Didn't get to spend a lot of time with her. And then after he spent a lot of time with her, he's like, oh, I don't like my wife. And I was like, bro, this sucks. And there's something about that that I will always find fascinating about humans. You all are so quick to marry, so quick to move in with people. I mean, I know, I understand. I did it in my 20s. Um, but like marriage isn't to keep dating. I don't know why people keep marrying people so they can keep dating them. Amazing how many of you are so happy to go through a divorce process. Because, like, girl, I don't want to do paperwork for nobody. You feel me? Mm-mm, ma'am. So, like, there is something to that that I think is interesting, you know? So when he says, like, you're in a marriage, you can't run away, that's only true if you're no longer dating. The only time in marriage you can't run away outside of abuse is when you're no longer dating. But if you think you're still just dating and you're married, which a lot of people do, then of course you can run away. So you don't have to tackle your problems. You can double down and hide yourself. Why do you think cheating is so bad? Why do you think lying to your partner is so bad? Why do you think financial infidelity is so bad? Because it's like, yo, I'm doing life with you. If doing life with you means a life of infidelity, like what? Like, you know what I mean? Sure. And one of the things a wife might think if a husband is expressing his annoyance is, 
she might want to get to the bottom of that too because maybe he needs some tooling and that's certainly possible but maybe she needs some adjustment too because the alternative for her is to live with someone who pretends to like her mm -hmm. yeah well you know if you want it Ooh, everyone be lying bro pretending to like your partner pretending not to be mad at them Ooh, girl hell that's a good one. <laughs> oh, seriously yeah. it's valentine's day and so i feel romantic and i wrote a poem for you guys you want what's up his prescribe your gift cutting and like you're not that you have some escape use the code no, it's like it's like having a child who's very badly behaved and you take that child out in public and everybody fought smiles falsely around them and pretends they i don't i go like this and i look at the kid and i look at the parent then i look at the kid and i know y'all are so sensitive parents are so sensitive about their kids and you wonder why parents don't break generational curses themselves and why they always say they were a perfect parent because you get really defensive when people look at your kid and then look at you and look at your kid and you're like, what? What? <laughs> Girl. Enjoy the child's company when Not inside me, they're bro. seething. I'll call that out. Well, I, I tell that to her all the time. <laughs> Control your kids, bro. Yeah. Control yeah. your kids. It's annoying. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's a certain utility in calling that out. But that's my Assyrian brother and I. We're like, what are you doing? We do a little brat problem for mm -hmm. the child in that situation especially if people say won't call it out is that the child lives in a world of false smiles right, and your marriage <laughs> your marriage can easily be a world of false smiles and that's brutal mm -hmm. brutal then you can't even complain because well everyone's smiling after all like, what's what's the problem mm -hmm. the problem is hatred in the guise of love that's the problem and that iciness that's underneath that it's awful Oof. people will lock themselves in like a homicidal embrace Oof. for decades because of that Oof. it's brutal that's what i'm saying insecurity fear is the root of all evil fear fear forces you into bad relationships bad money decisions bad decisions in general because you're so afraid of being alone you're so afraid of your own company you're so afraid and for what Gaming says, I know a guy in that situation, he hates his girlfriend, but doesn't want to be alone. You hate your girlfriend and would rather be with her than with yourself. How much do you hate yourself? How much do you hate yourself that you would rather be with somebody you hate than alone with your own consciousness? What do I say? And I'll say it again. If you're afraid to be alone, there's something you're hiding from internally. If you're truly afraid to be alone, meaning you're still holding on to the attachment of being entitled to people being with you and being close to you. There's something inside of your consciousness that is so ashamed to face yourself. You're willing to put yourself in this masochistic situation and you're willing to lie to somebody else and der derail their whole life. Cool. Good job, bros. Better to have the scrap. I, I have yeah. to ask you this because in my relationship here um, with this incredibly beautiful girl, inside and out um <laughs> extremely blessed to have you and i'll publicly say it all the time uh what does she think about you <laughs> he's also beautiful inside and out <laughs> he's a prince that's uh, what i think about him i um oh, i appreciate that uh <laughs> but i had to humble myself to be the correct man and so how is that going incredible when you realize that i ain't shit without god you know what i mean and so when you realize that I walk, I treat this relationship truly as if God gaveth me, but also can taketh away. So if I do not honor the gift that he's given me, which in the scripture says a good woman is one of the best gifts from God, then obviously he will remove me and give her to a man that's more deserving. Um, and how I had to come to that conclusion is... Yo, why aren't they married then? Why is she still just a girlfriend? that I'm not right and I'm not always in the right path and so that's scary when you love somebody and then you realize that you're bringing them along to hell if you're going the wrong direction that could get you know daunting and uh my question is our relationship found a very beautiful path when I said hey I'm gonna lead this house <laughs> but also God's gonna control it so if I'm in the wrong direction and she prays about it, God will open up my eyes and ears and then I'll try to fix it, vice versa. But we have this counseling that we come to the Lord with. 
How did you manage to have a beautiful, successful relationship without a counsel from God if your wife didn't believe in God while well, you did? How is that not? A- oh, I, I, don't, I don't think that wasn't the situation. I mean, first of all, people believe in God to a greater or lesser degree in some ways, regardless of what they say or think. So even people who are atheistic, it's a surface presumption, mostly. What do you mean? Well, I mean partly that we're opaque to ourselves, and so you can say you're an atheist, but that doesn't mean you are one. So that's that. just like <laughs> saying... You can say you're a Christian, but it doesn't mean you are one. I agree with this. Woman, saying you're a woman doesn't make you, are, make you a woman if you're a man, just like that. So, you know, my wife, my wife, I wouldn't say my wife ever was atheistic in her orientation. She certainly agreed when we decided to get married that she was going to tell me the truth. And that's a form of faith, a deep form of faith, mm. at, at minimum a form of faith in the truth. And that's like, that's a good start. Can, can I ask before you like peel the layer on that? So that way I make sure I'm following. Are you saying that? With her mouth, she said that there's no God, but with her... With her mouth, she what? Actions, she said there is a God. Well, she never said that with her mouth either. I mean, she never, she was never an avowed atheist. She just, she didn't go to church. She had drifted away from church, but... But But where is your counseling? And how do you, so your beliefs are in a higher God and you run your household. How do you run your household when one doesn't want to play ball with the fact that there is a creator out there that gave you a set of instructions to have a beautiful, fruitful relationship. If well, I didn't... she did play ball. Okay. She agreed, to, she agreed to tell me the truth, and she, she did that very, very diligently, I would say. Mm. Very diligently. And so... And how is her faith now? I know her, her, your, well, your new deepening. program is... Is that what opened up her eyes? Because that's what I was reading, that your wrestle with God kind of well, people, helped her. People, people's eyes open for all sorts of reasons. I mean... One of the things that happened, multiple, multiple things happened to Tammy. I mean, she spent a lot of time meditating. Um, she, had, she, w- she did yoga for decades, and that trained her ability to attend quite remarkably. Um, she's a very physically disciplined person. And then when things blew... Shout out to the Discord. We do professionally taught yoga once a month. We have our session coming up on Sunday, St. Patty's Day. So come and join us. Up around me she decided to climb on board uh, more professionally and started working with me and to- the other day my partner tried to prank me because i told you guys like we're both like we don't believe in a god gun to our heads we're 100 percent sure that one doesn't exist but obviously we can't know right but we're li- you know we're atheists by title because like you know um, but we don't know that. Nobody knows anything. Nobody knows if a God is real, dummy. Anyways, so the other day he was like, I have to tell you, I think I'm becoming more religious. And I looked at him and I was like, are you talking about D&D or something? What are you talking about? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, <laughs> trying to prank me as if you becoming more religious, sir. No, thank you. No, thank you. Gaming says yoga ain't for dudes. Um, yoga has no gender. Yoga has no gender. There is no gender. Touring with me, and one of the consequences of that was that she sat in the audience while I lectured like 200 times, and some of that made a difference. Hmm. And then she, she became very ill and just about died, and like every day for eight months, and just about starved to death, and... So I had to deal with that. Yeah. Well, that was just one of many things that was happening at the time because I was That's also tough very to deal ill with. and my daughter was very ill. Yeah, well, it was quite the ringer. And so that also... I'm going to make them talk faster. ...forced her and invited her to take herself and her life more seriously. But it wasn't just the suffering because one of the things that happened too as a consequence of her developing a fatal illness was that she came to the realization that her life meant more than she thought it did, not least because she saw, especially in her son's reaction to the news, how much her absence would mean to him. Mm. And so 
that's you know that's a lot of factors that were at play simultaneously. There's more than that. Too. I would, I would, I would, I, uh, there's a factor that I just can't stop thinking about, and it's as a Christian man, what did it do to you to see your loved one, God forbid, almost leave without knowing God, and we know the repercussions of that. It Why is George talking to Jordan like he's religious, right? This is like a religious fear. This is not a Jordan's not religious enough to have this fear, right? Or you know what I mean? Like that's such a religious fear. Um, Ren says stretching is queer coded. True, <laughs> true, bros, true. Did, was that terrifying? Of well, I didn't. I didn't formulate it that way. I mean, right. first of all, I didn't. I wasn't. Was I not ju not judging her? I never formulated what was happening to her in those terms. I mean. What was horrifying about it? Well, it was horrifying. It was terrifying, painful, not terrifying, painful to see her suffer. And, but was it terrifying to see her suffer in the absence of sufficient faith? No, I'm well, just not, saying not if God exactly, passes because she away. developed that very rapidly as it became necessary, increasingly mm. necessary. I mean, Tammy decided very early on in the process that she was going to accept what was coming her way and that she was going to make whatever changes were necessary and were offered to her and that she she accepted what happened to her with incredibly good grace you know lj hey girl says george is out of his depth in this conversation bro for sure bro visa says jordan is not christian per se is he he's very elusive about his beliefs i think jordan is afraid he's afraid of being wrong he's afraid of saying no to god if god is real He's afraid of owning God if God's not real. Like Jordan is a terrified, fearful man. He is so attached. He needs to practice Buddhism. He's so attached. He's attached to his wife dying. And listen to me when I say this, and I'm going to say this very, listen to me. I also get a little weepy recognizing that one day my husband will die on me and I will absolutely outlive him because I'm a woman. I fully will outlive my husband. I refuse to believe he will outlive me. It just never happens, okay? Unless I get cancer, then I'll die before him, okay? So when I think about him dying, I practice letting go of the attachment of thinking that I need to hoard him more than be grateful for him. I feel like when he talks about Tammy almost dying or even his daughter, I understand, I think, in premise, but I've meditated on my family's funerals so many times. I've worked on my own attachment to thinking my life would be ruined if they died. I don't want to be a person that loses a loved one and it kills me. I just don't think that's healthy. And I think there's some level of like not accepting, like a lack of radical acceptance that I do think is not, I'm not judging morally, but I think for myself is not introspective enough for me. I want to be so understanding of my own fears that they do not rule me, right? We talk about that a lot, how you should rule temptation. You should rule your fears. But the fear of a loved one dying, we give an exception to that. And I don't think we should. I think we should learn to love so deeply and profoundly. We let go of the attachment of feeling entitled to the people in our lives. For me personally, that obsession, that entitlement, that destruction, the fact that people will drink themselves after a child dies, will allow themselves to deteriorate, will think if I ever lose my spouse, like I won't even keep going. How is any of that healthy? How does any of that indicate any sort of deep understanding that people die? It's like denying the most obvious part of our lives. Look, everything is a mystery. Is God real? Are the gays real? <laughs> you know what's not a mystery? That you're going to die. The one thing we know for sure is the thing we refuse to spend any time meditating on in any profound way. Now, of course, there are bubbles that spend their whole lives meditating on death. There are absolutely bubbles that I have read about and learned about that absolutely do this from religious to secular. Okay? But again, when I see people lose themselves because somebody dies, that tells me they did not practice in any capacity. And lose yourself is not the same as feel sad. Lose themselves. Like they go insane. They lose themselves. It is not the same 
as feeling sad. Feeling distraught or sad, being devastated is not the same thing. Ruining your life because somebody died, that means you did not prepare or you're not having the relationship you need to have to not destroy your life. And it doesn't mean you can't come back from it, right? You can always destroy your life and start again. I believe that. But there, it's an indication to me, right? It's like when someone goes through a breakup. If you go through a breakup, is it within reason to commit suicide? I hope you all say no. But for some people out there, if you ever leave me, I'll kill myself. That's insane, right? Isn't it kind of insane that somebody dies in your life and you think you need to kill yourself now? What are you doing? It's insane either way. We just give a little bit more allowance for people to, quote, kill themselves or destroy themselves after their kid dies or their wife dies because we think it's it's different. Is it? Is it? It's different, but is it different? She's a very strong person. So well, She was disciplined before that, so it was probably easy for her to... Well, it certainly helped. Yeah. Yes, definitely. What do you think a man needs to be able to go to heaven? <laughs> Why is George asking for Jordan Peters in these questions? This this doesn't feel like anything in relation to to George uh, or to Jordan. I don't really want to watch this section, man's truth versus God's truth, but I want to get to you can't win an argument with your husband or wife. And eh, let's see what he says. What do you mean? What do you mean by heaven? Heaven yeah. is God's home, so it's not our choice. Truth. Yeah, truth. Sure. What truth? See, this is where I know Jordan doesn't quite believe in God. He's like not literally a Christian. But George thinks Jordan is a Christian. Jordan Peterson isn't a Christian yet. He just has an attraction to it. Yours or God's? You asked that before, so I'm not sure what distinction you're drawing. Reed has a truth, but in the eyes of God, that's lies. So in the grand scheme of things... Well, no some of it might be. Some of it's probably, you know... Well, hypothetically, we'll say that one's a lie. <laughs> but from... I mean, he misses the mark from time to time. Well, I'm just talking about the, the who is in charge, the creator, right? So that truth is not a, it's not, it's not a perspective thing. It's either you know or you don't know. And so when well, you Well, the question is to some... Okay, so the question you're posing to some degree is... When you knock on God's door, what grants you into his home? Because that day is coming. Every knee shall bow willing or non-willing. So your truth or the man next to your truth is meaningless. What is the truth to let him come into the kingdom of heaven? Well, it isn't that your truth is meaningless. It's that... See, this is where the words get tricky because modern people tend to think that truth is a set of descriptions of facts. But that's not what the truth is. The truth is, for example, the truth is the process by... The truth is your willingness to, to make manifest the process that enables you to learn and progress. Hmm. Right? That's, that's closer to what the truth constitutes. Ooh! Kind of vibes. <laughs> kind of base. <laughs> Okay, Jordan. Okay, kind of based. Kind of based. A process. That's why the truth is often represented as a spirit, right, rather than a set of descriptions. This is partly why I take offense, let's say, to some degree when people ask me if I believe in God. It's the same problem. People think of truth as something like fact, mm. and, and that's not what it is. That's one tiny aspect of what it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's so the first thing So then you I... said truth, you know, my truth, your truth, rather than God's truth. Well, See, whether those two things are distinct, to some degree, depends on how you conceptualize yourself. It might be true that you want something right now, let's say. And you might say, well, that's not a want that's in keeping with the ultimate and transcendent truths. And that could well be. But the uh, uh, Truth is like love to my brain. Like, what is love? It brings you closer to your joy. What is truth? It brings you closer to joy. Everything is rooted in that joy. And this is a version of what joy is, because truth is about joy. Joy doesn't keep you under false pretenses. Love doesn't, isn't made in fal false pretenses. So I think if I translated what Jordan said, for those of you who feel like you didn't follow, basically I feel like he's saying that you are closer to your joy than further away because it does not hold you captive. The truth sets you free. That idea that the truth sets you free is one of the most tr truthful sentences I've ever heard. I love that saying. It's saying like your joy will set you free. Anything that is true 
is be- that's why I've told you after my transformation a few years ago, I feel like the greatest thing I took away from that is that whatever is true, I'm good with. Whatever is true, I'm good with. But it's not true like a set of facts. True in terms of like the spirit of joy. True. Whatever is true, I'm good with. But if in any way I sense sussy baka, my intuition's like, that feels like a lie. And then you have to ask yourself, well, does it feel like a lie because you're traumatized? Does it feel like a lie because you're sensing it's not true? The truth will set you free, right? And if I feel tied down, something is either wrong with me, my perception of it, or you. And the question of the why, why do I feel that way? Why do you say that? What is your evidence? How do you feel about that? It's a combination of the truth of the spirit and the truth of the fact. So this idea of the truth will set you free, genuinely, that's why I always say, if God is real, great. If aliens are great, real, great. If magic is real, great. If this is real, great. I don't care. I'm not here to fight the truth. I'm simply here to observe it and to be a part of it. And before, and usually, what people do is they decide what's true, and then they find the evidence that makes them feel very solid in that perception. And then, of course, you have to challenge yourself and what you're perceiving when you feel like you have two very, let's say, strong voices disagreeing on what they think truth is. I think gender is so true. It is obviously so true to me. And it's in true in observation. It's so obviously true to me. But see, Jordan doesn't think it's true in the same way. He thinks that gender is true and real. He just thinks it's binary. And to me, it is so obviously so obviously true in, in a spectrum way. Now, and this is the problem, when you talk to people about facts, n- nothing's really true. When you talk to people about the spirit of truth, I think that's different and it sets you free. Notice how Jordan, when talking about gender, becomes angry and bitter. His mouth moves like this and he goes, oh, his face gets uglier. Because he's not examining truth. If he felt that was true, it should set him free. He should be happy being like, I I love that you're having this relationship with gender. I really don't think it's true though and here's why. Here's how, but he doesn't. When people are trying to convince you to think like them, see how, see how their face, Jordan's face, you know what I mean? Problem there that you're facing to some degree is that you've identified yourself with that local want. So when you say, you know, when you say my truth, when you're talking about, I don't mean mine personally, I mean Mm. personal truth, and you say that's in opposition to God, I would say, well, personal truth is in opposition to God in proportion to the degree that that person is self-obsessed. Yo, I don't know who is making all these gifts of me, but you are literally so good at it, bro. They're so funny. Discord be popping with these Britney Simon gifts, bro. Thank you so much. Tag them as Britney Simon and Tenor if you're going to upload them so I can find them because this is so good. And I appreciate it so much, girls. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. See, because yourself, the way you conceptualize yourself could be much broader. And then your truth would be more tightly aligned with what was transcendent. So, for example, look, look, look at it this way. Let me make it relatively straightforward. So... When you get married, the difference between you and your wife is supposed to disappear. Okay, so let's think that through, like really practically, not theologically, just practically. Well, why should that border be erased? Well, the reason is, is because the border will be erased. Because if you're going to live with someone for the next 50 years, they're as much you as you are. Not least because, well, there they are, like right beside you. There they are talking to you. There they are walking with you on the beach. Like, they're literally part of your experience, literally. And they're certainly a part of your experience that can make your life hell if, if they're not attended to properly. Amen. So like once you're married like that, the difference between you and your wife is insignificant. And so if you don't act like that, then all hell's going to break loose. If you do act like that, now imagine what you've done to your, your conception of yourself. Now it's broadened to include someone else. And so then I would say insofar as you serve that more broadened self, mm. you're, you've stepped quite a long ways out of your narrow self-concern into something that much more closely approximates a relationship with God. That's why marriage is a sacrament. Mm. That's why marriage is a Christian sacrament. is because entered into in the proper spirit, it's, it's, a, it's a step up Jacob's ladder. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but is your truth and say you accumulated a whole population of Canada to be all on your truth. Yeah. Is that greater than God's? That well, that's a reason. Is that greater than God's? <laughs> George is so cute. He's such a little bro. George is such a little bro. He's like, <laughs> dad, dad, though, dad, 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 listen, dad. Do you think your truth is greater than God's, though? <laughs> He's such a little boy. I love him. He just want to give him a little noogie. He's so cute. Reasonable question because, oh, so and what funny. you're pointing to there is the the. And I'm being condescending because, bro, it's like, sir, ma'am, sit down, bro. Go love it. Potential. I see what you're at, what you're after there. Well, Oof. people will find truth through consensus, and there are people who claim, especially in a moral, morally relativist, from a morally relativist perspective, that there is no truth other than consensus. But that brings you to <laughs> a problem very rapidly because you can end up with the consensus like the Nazi consensus. Right, where everyone believed, for example, that while well, the Jews were the great enemies of the German state and all of the atrocity that came along with that, every you absolutely, yeah, but also, you know, one played along with at least, even if they weren't active agents. So that was a false consensus. And your question is, well, what is there to protect against that false consensus? Well, that's a very good question, and I would say, well, certainly traditional conceptions of God are one of the things that- I wonder if George is following this or if he's like, what the fuck? I wasn't even thinking about that, bro. Protect us against false consensus. Sorry. There's no doubt about that. It's a double-edged sword because also tradition fights back on what God wants. Well, that, that well, that well, that's sure, sure. And, and then you might see in that, that eternal conundrum faced by liberals and conservatives because the conservatives would say, watch out for the now because it can get out of hand. And the liberals will see, yeah, but you can make a dogma out of tradition and wield it like a hammer. Mm. And both of those are true. And, 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 and well, that's partly why also why the truth has to be a dynamic process rather than say a statement of a set of statements, a set mm. of factual statements. So my truth growing up was that you need to be baptized. And then my truth grew into, you need a relationship with Christ. Mm. And then when I actually started looking for Christ, not because my mom and dad told me to, but because my heart yearned for it, I fell into this part of the Bible where they did talk about a man who goes into heaven. And it was the, the thief on the cross. And that man never went down into charity. That man never went down off the cross and got baptized. That man never shook his neighbor and says, it's good news, Christ is coming back. But he looked at Christ in his face amongst everyone who stared at him and he said, ah, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the one true God. Do not forget me when you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And God said, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Because he knew who God was and what he was doing for him. Okay, and, and what's the... Well, oh, hold on. Jordan's going to do it. The implication of that. Implication is regardless of how much you emphasize or manifest your truth, your truth will never be bigger than God's. No, what? That is not the lesson I took from that. Okay. Well, I would say with all due respect, that's close. There. Well, okay. I take that so, with respect. I take that with respect. Yeah, I'm yeah, close. Well, I, think, I think that like you're, you're on the trail of something there. So there's an idea that no matter what your sins, if you confess, then you can be forgiven. And in some ways to confess is to admit to, it's to admit your insufficiency in relationship to something higher than you. That's mm. a good way of thinking about it. Mm. That is what happens to that thief. So he's, he's a bad guy, but on his deathbed, he recognizes the truth. Yeah. And that's sufficient to redeem him. Yeah. Now, yeah, in yeah, that is what it is. See, ooh, girl. Colleen says you would never guess Jordan Peterson's, uh, you never guess Peterson holds the beliefs he does while listening to these types of convos. Bro. Sometimes Jordan, Jordan is so nuanced and so good and he's, he totally gets it. And then he goes, but the trans people are ruining our lives. And I'm like, bro, focus, please. Lipstick on pigs. And I'm like, Fo focus, please. What would we do with all the men? F like, focus. Like he like loses it. He has it and then he loses it, bro. I'm telling you that's the, the, the fear is the root of all evil. And his fear keeps him from really taking that to such a degree which is why even if you're like on my level of introspection like you're a five or whatever you fall prey to your own biology and your own genetic fear your own trauma your own background with peace and love i love you so much but like humans gonna human whether you're twos or fives practice people criticize that sort of idea because you might say you could play both ends against the middle then and so your best bet is to be like hedonistic mafioso um, 
Leo in the chat. Leo says you did a video on my mom on my bio dad and stepmom. I want you to hear my side of the story. If you are the Leo from the story, uh, you're still a minor, right? With peace and love. I don't talk to minors. So I appreciate you reaching out, but I have a huge hesitancy with talking to kids. Um, so if that is you, I really hope uh, things are going well for you. I hope your life is getting better. Um, I, if you have like a, uh, I kind of in a rough, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I can't talk to kids and you're a kid. So, um, I don't know how to get around that, but if you are that Leo that I hope you're doing well and it's tough, but you get better. And so, uh, you know, reach out when you're 18. Until you're 85 and then to, you know, repent on your deathbed. And, <laughs> and that's a, that's a, that's a cop way out because I know, God, I know. Yeah, that's God, my point. Yeah. yeah, yeah Cause point. they love but, to say that. They love to say, but remember God doesn't judge your actions. He judges your heart. You can't hide your heart from God. So in the scripture, it says it's better for you not to know and do, do that crime than for you to yes, know. Yes, definitely. Exactly. Yes, definitely. Um, and, well, and, and, and so the problem with a, with a deathbed confession is that in order for it to take, you have to get to the bottom of things. And if you had accrued up a whole hell of lifetime catastrophe, you'd have to face all that. Well, it also comes with regulations, right? A judge, for say, is standing before you and you, in your heart of heart and your truth is, I was checking on my toddler, I thought he was choking, and I ac accidentally hit a red light. And the judge does not care because you hit the red light. So he's judging you on what your crime was. Now he could show you grace, but you still did the crime. So it is in the hands of the judge. So when you stand and tell your truth to the judge, Leo says, I just want my story to be heard and I respect that you don't talk to kids though. I definitely think you should take it to TikTok. You know what I mean? Like, do you, you're legally allowed to have a TikTok. So if you take it to the internet, um, I think that's a good way to get your story heard. And I technically can react to it, but I, I don't interview children. I can't talk to kids um, without their parents' consent. And I don't think your parents are going to give me their consent. Um, just like I try to stay away from it. But um, I think your story is important. I'm sure it needs to be heard. Take care of yourself. And remember, the internet's not your friend. It's not your friend. Judge, it's in his hands. So when he gives you rule books, like, for example, uh, how you judge your neighbor will be measured to how I judge you. That's a very big standpoint. Mm. When it came to forgiving other people, I asked God, God, why should I forget other people? Like, why? Because respectfully, F that dude. I, I tried over yeah. and over and over again. Why would I? And then when I get hit with a fierce statement of how you measure how much you forgive somebody, I'm going to take that same measurement. So fear, fear, fear. Everyone is so afraid. George is so afraid. And measure you with yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's an inevitability. And that's, another, that's another example of the pragmatic utility of those injunctions. So you could imagine if you're habitually, imagine you're a habitually harshly judgmental person. Mm. And so everyone around you that interacts with you comes to experience that. They'll reflect it. Mm. So you will be judged by the standard that you use to judge others. That happens almost immediately. Yep. But there's more to it than that, because if you develop a very harsh set of judgmental standards and you apply them to others, you will use the same tool on yourself. Because the probability that you're sophisticated enough over any reasonable amount of time to conjure up one set of standards for everyone else and another for you, it's like no one can handle that balancing act, that juggling act, those things will interpenetrate. And so part of, see, that, and that is relevant to an issue that we discussed earlier, which is the issue of forgiveness. I mean, part of the reason that you want to do what you can to set yourself up so that you can forgive is so that the same grace will be extended to you. So for example, if we go back. I do, I do think, I do think forgiving like the golden rule is a nice idea. Treat people how you want to be treated. But I also think it says sets a false precedent, which is that you need to forgive so you're forgiven. You need to forgive to set yourself free. You need to forgive people who do you wrong to set yourself free. Not so people can forgive you. Though, when you truly are well-intentioned and you let go of grudges, you do tend to have a light about you that tends to have people treat you better because it's just good people being good to each other. But I don't think you should feel you're deserved. Nobody deserves anything. You don't deserve kindness or love. You don't deserve anything. You're an animal on a planet. 
But what you can give yourself is the gift of forgiveness, is the gift of love. What you can give others is that if you'd like. But I, I kind of don't love this idea that George and, and Jordan are talking about, which is like you forgive so people forgive you. Like, mm, mm, I don't love that. But I do agree that like be careful how you judge. You know, the one without sin, throw the ca cast the first stone, you know. Back to a concrete situation. So you're married to someone. Now you're going to interact with them tens of thousands of times, right? And so you will encounter problems together. And sometimes there'll be problems that you cause and sometimes mm -hmm. there'll be problems that he causes or some joint contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever grace he shows you in the negotiations when you're at fault, that's exactly what you'll reflect back as mm. the marriage progresses. Mm. Obviously, because well, obviously, how else could it possibly be? And so you, de you do. And the marriage is a very good example of this. Great it's example. the tightest example. It's like you will you will receive what you deliver in a marriage <laughs> and often very rap very rapidly yeah. and that's that's a very useful thing to understand because then you can ask yourself and and this is the same this is the same gospel injunction about wanting to be treated like you would uh, treating others like you would want to be treated it's like that's something you really want to apply to your wife not least because you're stuck with her like she's a mirror she's a mirror so you're saying so. it's kind of when we're in a situation and if he's, you know, not showing me, you know, quite grace and he's taking things very harshly, you know, and he's being very hard on me, yeah. then it's kind of the way that he's treating me in this situation. I'm like, hmm, I'm going to remember that for when well, the rules no, are reversed. Well, partly that, partly it'll be conscious, but partly you'll also just, you'll just come to imitate that and mm. even unconsciously. You are Because it'll become the pattern of your relationship. Yep. Mm. Right. And so sometimes you'll wield that like a club, you know, you did this to me, so now I'm going to deal, deal that way with you. Right. But often it's just more subtle. Mm. You don't right? even know it. No, yeah, well, and you just, practice what you become, right. you know, and you also become what others... Uh, I had an ex, and he used to say practice makes permanent. And I used to think that was pretty damn good. They say practice makes perfect, but I do think practice makes permanent. So that really stayed with me. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Near you practice, because <sighs> we're, very, we're very imitative creatures. Yep. And so... We're sheep. We certainly have that aspect. We can also be shepherds, you know, so yeah. so the, the, the metaphor extends in all sorts of different directions. Mm. But, and it is, it is also good to know, one of the things my wife and I learned to do, and, and we, we, do, we literally do this, is if we're caught on the horns of a dilemma and we, we can't get out of it, we'll stop arguing if we have enough sense. Because, you know, if you get angry, both of you want to win and... That's not helpful. You can't, that's another thing to know. You cannot win an argument with your husband. Mm. And he can't win an, ar a husband can't win an argument with his wife. Not unless he wants to defeat her, in mm. which case... He defeats himself. Well, he lives with a defeated woman. Like, <laughs> well, seriously. I thought he was going to go like, so deep with it. Well, what, just, yeah, what good so is that going to be? That's not helpful. And like, you guys are one. So if you defeat her, you defeat... Well, my husband and I have a rule. We don't compete against each other. We're not each other's competition ever. So that's kind of our rule. Because we're both very competitive people. The people we do not compete against is ourselves, like each other. So that's kind of our rules. Like if we find ourselves, if we've noticed we're competing, we go, oh, because eh, eh, eh. bitch, I will not lose, bitch. And then he will not lose. And then it's a whole thing. So yeah, we don't compete against one another. We are not each other's opposing teams. We are on the same team and you don't compete with your own teammates. That's how jealousy and envy and negativity breed it you know breeds itself you know for yourself well not least because now you're living with someone who's defeated and bitter mm. it's not helpful you can't win an argument what you have to do you can't you can't stomp around and insist that you were right look this happens to couples all the time so imagine that one person in the couple is better at verbal disputes than the other that doesn't mean they're smarter and it doesn't mean that they're more I just said correct this. Yeah. you're just good at your skill yeah, of yeah. talking yeah. yeah exactly now so one of the things you want to do so imagine in a relationship that, so what do you want to do about that? If you happen to be the person who's better at making verbal arguments, well, one of the things you want to do is, if your wife has a problem with you, you want to help her make her argument. Just on the off chance that she's got something to say, because maybe she's right, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to be in her interest to straighten you out if she has any sense, and it would be in your interest to listen. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of giving the devil, that's part of loving your enemy, that's part of giving the devil his due. It's like... You want to find out. You want to find out. So you don't have to bring the trouble forward. We're going to be...
I would love to be vulnerable. And if you want to cut this out, we could absolutely cut it out because obviously when I get vulnerable, it disgusts you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before I do, um, I'm, I'm just going to go pee real quick. Could you refill this drink? Yeah, of course. Um, I'll just be right back. I'm sorry. I drank a lot of Celsius to get ready. No problem. <laughs> no, no explanation necessary. So now are you participating in all of these podcasts? Yes. Yeah, I'm his co-host. I wasn't able to go to the Andrew Tate one because, I mean, obviously, you know, he was going to gross. Romania. He didn't know Andrew Tate, you know, so mm -hmm. gross. Because that reason, then he thought, you know, we thought it'd be better. That podcast got so many views. I didn't watch it, but I was annoyed with George for collaborating with Tate. That's frustrating to me. But I didn't see it. So maybe he, like, did good. But it got too many views and people were praising it. I don't like Tate. <laughs> For me to stay back on that one mm -hmm. and for him to go thank in. Thank you, thank you. And then, um, and, uh, and yeah, so usually for the most part, I'm always there for with guests, unless it's something that, you know, speaks to George's heart where he feels like he wants to, you know, be there one one, but I, he enjoys having me. And how long have him. you been doing the podcast w together? Uh, I started with him when he started this by himself, so about a year. I see, I yeah. see. And are you enjoying it? I'm absolutely enjoying it. Are you getting it. better at it? I, I think so. She I, is. <laughs> she is. What, and and how, 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 how is she getting better? Um, What's better? I'd say just adding to the conversation knowing when things don't get fully uh I articulated see. yeah and because george can be very like linear and just go and bell will sometimes be like don't forget about this part and cause right right so by. she's tracking exactly yeah, yeah that's and, helpful um yeah just being another being another perspective absolutely yeah, yeah. Well, thank so you excited. yes well you ask pretty clear-headed questions and they're quite oh. personal thank you. i don't mean that they're personal questions mm -hmm. that you make of your guests but they're like they're not abstracted oh mm -hmm. you know and thank so you. i appreciate that yeah well that's mm -hmm. useful that that'll also help That'll, that, that'll make it easier for your guests to also see where you're coming from. Thank you. So. Yeah, it's, it's all very new to me, but I've been really enjoying the process of it and sitting down with people and having these conversations. And, you know, I'm not somebody who's as well, you know, versed in, in certain debates and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I have a great interest in how people think. And my first love is acting. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm an actress. And I, the reason why I got into acting, actually, is because I'm so interested in the reason why people do the things that they do and understanding kind of like what's built them up to be the person that they are. Mm -hmm. So in a sense... So you can explore that by through acting. Right, like and through on characters. Different roles. Yeah, and, you know, kind of picking apart their lives and mm -hmm. that's what interests me. Mm -hmm. Many people told me not to have her as my co-host when I started. Uh, but the two things that hit me in the head was uh, my friend told me when you do podcasting, you're going to grow rapidly because you, you start monitoring how you speak, how you talk, and it just makes you have to hold yourself at a level of, like, respect. Um... And then two, she's just like, I truly think she's like this incredible woman. I learned so much from her. And my goal is to teach people uh, things that I'm learning as I'm growing. And so if I'm going to grow stronger and wiser and I have a platform, why not bring my partner? Well, well, you know, one of the things I've learned. So Tammy started to do the intros for my lectures when we're touring. Yeah. And to begin with, she was just announcing some of the. Uh, see, Tammy and Jordan do work together. Their relationship is public. They talk about it. George and his relationship is public uh, versus when we were watching Julia and Eileen and I was saying like, don't make your relationship like content. They do it in a way that is much more reasonable. I think there's a way to make your relationship content without bringing the audience into your relationship. So I'm less concerned about George and T George, less concerned about Jordan and Tammy bringing their relationship to the internet than I am for like a Julia and Eileen as an example. Endeavors that we were engaged in uh, this essay app that my son and I developed to help people learn to write and Peterson Academy this university that I'm online university that I'm launching with my daughter and so Tammy would describe them but then she started to talk about the rules in my book from a personal perspective and started to develop a corpus of her own stories and so that's been fun but also I had her um, I invited her to ask me to take questions from the audience and ask me the questions because there's a Q&A at the end and one of the things we found which was very interesting and that we didn't expect was that the audience very much appreciated our, the fact that we were together on stage and interacting. That, mm. And we learned part of that was, and this is something to know too, is that there are a lot of people out there who've never really watched a civilized interaction between two people in an intimate, a man and a woman in an intimate relationship. Mm. They just don't have that in their repertoire. Mm. Wait, sorry, I missed it because I dropped my earphone. There are a lot of people out there who've never really watched a civilized interaction between two people in an intimate, a man and a woman in an intimate relationship. True. And it shows. They just don't have that in their repertoire. Mm. And so the fact that we were doing this and could do it together and that she could ask me questions and tease a bit and play and listen, let's say, and chime in from time to time, people found that intriguing 
And they also found it comforting in a way, you know, because if people are hoping, if people are gathering something of value from your words, they're hoping that the source is real. They're hoping that it's not an act, that it's not show. And one of the ways that you can test that is by watching the person interact, let's say, with their wife. Mm. It's very direct, right? And it's a hard thing to fake, especially continually. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was, it was good for people in relationship to example, but it was also, it also helped them ensure that their trust wasn't misplaced. That's very interesting. So, that's a, mm. that's, yeah, it was that very interesting. We didn't expect that. And I'm sure all. for the people, for your audience, the people in your audience, you know, a lot of people don't come from homes where their parents are still together. Yeah. And so or that's where also, they ever talked. Right. And yeah. Which is why often they're not together. Right. Because mm. they didn't communicate. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And Communication so, is key. Biggest yeah. thing. All right. Time to get vulnerable. Oh, no. <laughs> and again, babe, if you, if you want me to take this out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can take this out. Far, this. And if we don't. Okay. This is uh, what I wanted. I think. Then it'll just be something that I at least got blessed with an opportunity to have a conversation with you about. When I wasn't in a relationship, I would, you know, have fun. Because the people that loved me, even though they were Christians, were like, hey, go have fun, go have sex, go like enjoy before you get married. And they would build up marriages. This is like, this is like, okay, that's it. It's final. You only get one woman. So when I How lost- How many women can you stand? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a turbulence of life. And it's a lie that they try to sell you. The, the music, the movies, all that stuff. Is, it's all full of shit. But I had to learn that the hard way, sadly. And God willing, I could teach my son that that's a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. Sorry for my language. I know I'm trying to swear. <laughs> um, what it was, was a non-Christian man that actually challenged it? me. What was wrong with it? Uh, it's emptiness. It was me searching for uh, love. Where I, my perspective, not my POV now is, love is your dance with God, right? So you could find love in your the worst case scenarios in life, but if you bring God involved, you could be in the trenches and still have peace and joy. Well, in these relationships that were primarily aimed at sexual pleasure. Yeah. Well, what exactly was the problem with that? Like specifically. Why was that? Why? So I mean, many. I talked to other people about this, and some some people. Yeah, yeah, I talked so, to Russell Brand about this, for example. And Russell, <coughs> gross. Russell had plenty of opportunity for yeah. you know, I extra guess, extra for for casual sex. Yeah, right. So think, what was wrong with that? I think everybody, every man will have his own version of why it was wrong for him, right? Russell might have a different version of why it was yeah. wrong for him. My version was I loved God, and I knew that I wasn't walking in obedience. So how did you know? My mother told me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know? but why did that stick? Because the scripture says to honor your mother's teachings. Yeah, but it must have God, George is so sweetly dumb, bro. He has no introspective capability. I love George. I mean this with love. He has no idea why he does anything he does. It's, it's fucking beautiful, isn't it? Look at Georgie. Oh, little Georgie. Habibi doesn't know why he does anything he does. He's a perfect little two. <laughs> Wow. Refle it must have ref okay, okay, so okay, so, so I was okay, embarrassed to call Jordan's like, okay. Oh, he doesn't know why he does anything. Only my mom saying my condom broke. I think I got a hoe pregnant, and now I think my actions okay, so are going to be shame in front of your mother. Yeah, and now I'm embarrassingly asking my mom to fast so that way I don't have a baby with a girl. Alexi that says himbo energy, bro. I never met, and I don't want anything to do with it. It's, it's shameful. See what I mean? George is successful. George has money. George is so sweet. He has a whole relationship with his family. He's got a gorgeous girlfriend. He's talking to celebrities. Introspection does not equate fame. Introspection doesn't equate popularity. Just because you can make money doesn't mean you know shit. Like, bro, I love him. Well, so why did you care what your mother thought? Because if I fail to care what my mother thought, then what kind of son of a bitch would well, I be? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, no, but, but you know, there are people who- Oh my God, he's beautiful, Georgie. His relationship with her mother is disturbed enough so they don't care what she exactly thinks. so why did why did you care what your mother thought because god blessed me with two parents that i should kiss the ground that they walk on let to be young and naive to be george to be a thief oh my god he's so sweet he's just like He's the sweetest little boy I've ever seen in my whole life. And I know men don't like it when they get infantilized, but Jesus Christ. Ma'am. Ma'am. <laughs> He's so sweet. Holy fuck. He's like a little kid. Uh, you see how why answering the question why is so hard? And by the way, he doesn't have to do anything. He's perfectly happy. But like, oh. Let alone care what they think of. Okay, okay. So, so you had a good mother, a great mother. Yeah, better okay. than I even deserved. But God bless me with one. Right. Okay. So it mattered to you what she thought, and you felt that. I hate when people talk this way. It's so fake when people talk this way. 
it just screams so shallow. I'm sure he profoundly loves his parents, but it's just so shallow. Better than I deserve. She's better than I deserve. Like, take your mom off a pedestal. Why are you pedestaling people? Weird. Weird take, bro. Well, you can imagine what that means, too, because your mother's a woman. <sighs> so if you were mistreating other women... Then, never did. Never. I was well, good at that. I was well, good at that. Good like, at. I was good at being able to be honest with them and like, hey, this is a fun time. Oh, oh even if they were like a girl, like a random, you know, quote unquote, like a hoe from the streets, like I would still take them out, buy them flowers, open the door for them. I never disrespected, no matter what class girl was. Except for the sex. I, I say my slang. My okay, this is the part I saw clipped that I was curious about. Why is Jordan Peterson anti premarital sex? If he is, I don't know. The clip, I could have seen it out of context. So let's see the context. My, my line is, I'm a gentleman until the bedroom door locks. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the... I, I told that you was, I was the cover be, story. I, was gonna, I told you I was going to be very vulnerable. First, that was your vulnerability. And second of all, what a fuck a boy, bro. Uh, but this is the best part is that she knows everything about me. I know everything yeah. about her. Well, well I think that must I be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but how I see in these situations is that I, you know, I thought you were going to bring up something about us. And no, no, I, that... I have, I'm just walking my way to oh, okay, it. Okay, okay. Uh, but for this part, I mean, that's no, no, no. no. Trust passes, me, so. this is the easy part. All right. Oh, uh, okay. So this is not okay. 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 So this is not the vulnerable part. Then an atheist actually said, you believe in God? And I go, yeah, of course. And I don't have these conversations that I have it, uh, behind cameras. And um, he goes, I don't get, wh why do you go around sleeping? And I said, I'll treat the right girl right when God brings me the right girl. And he says, well, if he's your father in heaven, he goes, why would he bring you the right girl when you're acting wrong? And I was like, whoa. So I changed my approach, became abstinent. And uh, through that, I was blessed with the opportunity to meet her. And But my behavior didn't change. We didn't wait till we were married. And this is where I'm circling towards because you're a scholar and I know that you've dove into the Bible in a, in a sense of faith-based like examination and also logically understanding what a parable might be. Like for example, get up, move a mountain and, and go that way. Um, when I would have sex with Belle, Shauna, I was like, Belle, uh, this is, I'm so, I'm so uncomfortable, this is like a, I would ask her to remove her cross from her neck because I wouldn't be able to even uh, perform. That should have been a hint. Yeah. <laughs> and while she would always, she got to the point where she would take her cross off and sometimes when we carried on through the day, I realized that her cross was off and that's because of me. And uh, Oh yeah. And uh, that rocked me because I knew. Okay, that's quite introspective of, uh, of him to realize that on his own. You know what I mean? That's pretty good, right? You know what I mean? That's pretty good. You know? Um, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty funny. That's, oof. that's good though. I'm glad that he recognized that in himself. That means that's good, but that's also really ironic. That's why I say these Christians all have this like relationship with Christ, but all of them be fucking. It's funny. It's a little funny. Uh, Leo says, if I was to create a few more videos sharing my side of the story, would you be able to watch them? So one thing I want to say, Leo, and I know, like, again, you're a minor. I really wish the best for you. But one thing I want to caution you against is trusting random streamers on the Internet, even someone as good as me. Because ultimately, like, streamers are not your friend and people might have bad intentions for you. The people you should trust are people close in your life. Hopefully you have somebody in your life that can advocate for you. Maybe you can reach out to LGBT organizations, uh, advocate C groups for trans kids, because regular streamers, myself included, like we're not the body that can best represent or advocate for you the way these organizations can, who can hire lawyers, who can hire people to advocate for you. So I heavily recommend reaching out to those people. You can find them via Google. You can go to LGBT centers, make some phone calls, you know, send your TikToks to them. I appreciate that you're reaching out to me. I'm assuming you saw my video on your parents and you think like, oh my gosh, Brittany's on my side. Of course, I'm on the side of anyone that needs to, you know, be closer to their joy, but I'm still just a stranger and I'm an adult. And so there could be some, you know, you just want to protect yourself even against somebody as great as me because I don't have any ill intention towards you, but the wrong streamer might. So I really recommend going through organizations that is the best way to get good representation, especially if you're dealing with a legal case, which I know you are. So I'm sending love to you. I'm even sending love to your parents, you know, whoever's involved. But ultimately, like, just I got to put a boundary down. I'm just a streamer. I'm not the best person to advocate for you. I am simply a content creator. You should reach out to organizations. They will help you much more, much more than I will ever be able to help you. Do that. I voluntarily, I pushed the person that I love the most in the wrong direction. And I know one day I'll be, I'll be answering to that. And See, George's fear, I'll be answering to that. 
I did that. That guilt, bro, you need to move on. It looks like you're asking for it right now. And um, Lexi says, if you have to remove something that reminds you of your values, something you probably shouldn't do because um, it's not your values, you need to introspect and adjust your values. Well, that's what I mean when I say people don't have values. They think they have values, but they don't have them. They think they have values, but they don't really have values. And it's really difficult to know your values because they're constructs and temptation will come knocking at your door. And that's sort of the irony is that regardless if you're a religious person or if you're a secular person, I should see some consistencies with your values, but not in the way of like bullet point facts, like Jordan was talking earlier, but the way of seeking real truth. You know, what's been interesting is I've been seeing some criticism on my channel, very little, of people being very confused about my recent takes about essay stuff, but it's very consistent with what I've been saying. And I think when people hear me talk, they, they put me in a bubble and they say, well, if Brittany believes this, she must believe this, but they don't hear my full context or my full thought about it. So what they do is they think like, well, Brittany's um, this, like they, they make a leap of understanding instead of actually understanding Britney. They put me in a box, which is fair, reasonable. They're trying to categorize me, but they keep miscategorizing me. And then they get confused. It's like when the internet thinks I'm a crystal girl. As much as like that's makes sense to me somewhat, it's so wrong. Like that's not my categorization. And so that's the irony is if they keep going, miscategorizing you, thinking they understand what bubble you're in, then they're going to be oh my God, she's a hypocrite. She said this, but you didn't even assess me correctly in the first place. That's why I'm very cynical about criticism videos of my work, because if you can't even categorize me correctly, like categorize me correctly, then criticize me, I'm open. I love it. But if you can't even criticize me, like you can't categorize me correctly, how are you even going to criticize me? Like you're, like you're not even ready to even like understand my category. So again, like with peace and love. So I think George, it's interesting He's bubbled himself as a Christian. He says he has Christian values. And that's why I say fake Christians versus real Christians. Okay. And, you know, Logan Paul and him fought about this a lot. And Logan would say, like, you drink, you have sex. Why do you keep saying you're a Christian? He goes, I'm on a journey, man. I'm on a journey. Yes, you're on a journey. But haram. You're on a journey. But haramville. It's like these Muslims are like, I'm a Muslim. Haram, bro. Again, y'all want the title without the responsibility. You all want the title without the discipline. And it was something that was really challenging for me. And it got Did you learn? I'm getting there. Okay. And, uh, and I would have conversations with God and there would be times where we would go a long time without doing it. And then I would, you know, I'd break down to the, to the stupid man that I am today and, and I would fall again and I'd get up. And, but the one it's like thing a fake hum humbleness. It's like a false humility. George has false humility. I, I'm calling it right now. That I can't get off my chest yeah. is it, stuck there. It's uh, when I asked her to marry me and I made a promise to God first and then I made a promise to her father on earth. Uh, what? Um, he didn't call her fiance, did he? Didn't he say girlfriend? That when she is mine, I will honor her like my church. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, this thing in my chest, man, like it, immediately when I had his blessing, it left me. And I felt like this... Like, God forbid, I had cancer in me and, and it was, it just died and left and I couldn't unshake it. And so we had our relatives over and we, she had to go with her father. I had to go this way. So the magic was still, we were dancing between just being engaged. And so finally I was like, we made a promise. Like when we get engaged, we're not going to do anything until marriage. And, and then we, you know, we were distant, we we're distant. And finally, when we saw each other and we were in the moment, obviously we we're going to, you know, fail and, and have sex. But right before we had sex, I looked at her and I had no shame about the cross being on her anymore. And I said, leave it on. I don't know why. Can I, do, do my levels of introspection not make so much more sense when you watch a George? But it was so there, that feeling of like, I felt like when God looked out at me before, he wasn't pleased with me, but at that moment he was pleased with me. Okay, what had changed? So I searched for it, because okay. I was like, I feel it, it's a spirit, I feel it. And I dove in, and I dove in the Bible. Where in the Bible does it say a priest has to ordain it, or there has to be another man that tells me, do you do you take her, or do you take this? And I'm trying to dig and dig and dig. And then I call my, my friend Cliff, him and his son Stuart. They go around, and they, they talk about the gospel, and he's a great man that I could call. And he always answers. And, and I'm crying on the phone. I go, Cliff, I can't find where the marriage ceremony is that God blesses a man. All I could find is that when the father gives permission, 
And then I thought as humans, when we corrupt God's word, we always place a man in between us and God, that this man has to finish up God's work. And then I thought, well, it just makes so much sense that if I would have taken a woman for her house, all I really truly need in God's eyes is the permission of her father. So now I'm looking through the scripture and I can't find anywhere besides showing the world that I've made a promise to her. And that is now my covenant with her. So what I'm going to is now when I look at her, I don't, I don't feel like I have to wait for a man to tell me that you're now married. I made that promise to God. And when I look at her, this woman. Yeah, but why aren't they married? That's the love of your life and you're not going to marry her. You're a Christian, but you haven't married her. Cool. Lexi says, if, uh, if I was his girlfriend and he was saying he felt shame about sleeping with me, I'd be like, pardon bubbles, I guess that would make me feel hurtful. Well, Oh, he's doubling down. So I heard, I wonder if this is okay. Jordan. Now I get why Jordan is going to hold him accountable for this. Cause I would too. See when I work with Christians or religious people, or I, I do calls with people who are religious. I'm like, I'm going to hold you to that standard. Because you trying to justify it, girl, no, ma'am. I almost feel guilty telling people that that's my fiance when and truly I feel that's my wife already. I've made that. So marry her. So marry her. So marry her. Marry her. I promise to God. I've already showed it to the world that that is my woman and that's my covenant. What is your thoughts behind this? Am I, am I just a fool trying to look for another way into having sex without no, any I guilt? No, I think or? that's some of the least, least foolish things you've said so far today. <laughs> I'm oh, Jordan's being so nice to him. I'll be mean. Absolutely. You pussy, bro. You're a fucking pussy, George. I love you. You're pussy, bro. I don't even know how to take that. Is that like a good <laughs> no, thing? Well, well, no. Um, yes, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And it wasn't an insult to the other things you said. Alex said she agreed to take the cross off to fuck, though. I want to know her thoughts on justifying that. I don't think she cares. I think she's doing the thing all women do, which is put up with a man who can't provide or actually, like, move, like, go through with his promises. You know what I mean? Like... She either doesn't believe in the Christianity, values herself, she agrees with him, or she just like doesn't care, which I'm not sure which one is more of a red flag. You know, and again, I tell this story again. When Farm Brother was dating women and he was trying to figure out who to marry, women would say, oh, for you, I'll stop having premarital sex. Like for you, I'll definitely like become Catholic. And he's like, no, I don't want you to become Catholic for me. I want you to be Catholic. I want you to come to Christ by yourself. I want you to do this for yourself. So I know I'm marrying somebody who has conviction and isn't just doing it for me, right? And so it's kind of like this irony where I think so many people are willing to settle and also they're not as they don't have strong conviction in the same capacity or in the same way. And conviction is very hard to have because you also don't want to have blinded conviction. And that's also difficult, right? So George, George definitely leapt through fucking Bible verse after Bible verse just so he could pound pussy, bro. That's what I'm hearing. It was an answer to your question about what, you know, what I thought about what you said. Okay, so what do I make of it? Well, the first thing I would make of it is that you were and are far more traditional than you wanted to think. I mean, because the story you just said had two no. components that you just told me. Number one was when you were no. casually sleeping around, you were actually violating your covenant with your mother. Yeah. Right. And you were violating that, not least because she was a good woman. She was a good mother. And that meant in some ways, what would you say? She was emblematic of women as such. And you were violating that in your behavior. And so you couldn't face her. My and truth was that I told her already. So I told my parents, like, hey, guys, I'm just going to be doing this. And I thought that that's my truth. Right. That's why well, that's my, my see, truth that, well, is garbage. Well, that's what I meant earlier when I said that truth is not merely what you say. Right. That's a good example of that. Now, mm -hmm. oh, it yeah. turns out that you were traditional in more than one way, deeply. One was that you were traditional in relationship to your mother, but you were also traditional in relationship to the father because some of what you were doing with women, given that it wasn't smiled upon by the father, violated you your the basic precepts of your conscience. Now, you might say, why didn't you pay attention to that? That's easy. It's like, well, you can't pay attention to that and have casual sex. So, you know, people will choose the hedonic route in a second. And that's particularly true in a culture like ours where that's celebrated and any objection to it is in some ways even demonized. Who are you to say that, you know, there's something wrong with casual sex? It's like, for me, casual sex is a contradiction in terms. I just, I just think it's a preposterous concept because I don't think that anything that intimate can be casual. Mm -hmm. Like, intimacy and casualness, they're <laughs> not, not the, it's like the- Man, you just never sucked the dick before, bro. I'm telling you right now, it could be casual as fuck. You ever just like, suck a dick? And you're not thinking about it. You're just like thinking about paying bills. You suck at a dick. It's casual as fuck, bro. Unity of diversity. I feel like you can have casual sex with your husband. I just feel like it's casual. It's chill. It's like, 
it's like you're not making love, you're having sex. Like, I feel like there's a difference. You know, I feel like when I'm being like super, super in the moment, it's just different. And yes, I do make eye contacts with my husband. Thank you. I know before I struggled to make eye contact because that level of intimacy, but I know how to do that now, kids. So let me tell you, I make straight up autistic eye contact. It's in you know, the word intimate, intimacy. Well, yes, that's right. It's, right. it's exactly, okay. it's, already, it's already in that. And so, so, well, so... Okay, now the next part of it you said was that as far as you're- Yo, this is why people feel so entitled to your body and your time because they're like, what we just did was so intimate. Bro, intimacy does not not mean casual. I be intimate with strangers all the fucking time. You ever have someone cry on your shoulder that you've never met and they're being intimate with you because they're giving you like all their life secrets? Still casual as fuck, bro. You're concerned. At, at some deep level, you're already married. Well, th that could be. You know, I guess what I would ask you then is why bother with the ceremony? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't at all. I'm not saying that in the least. But well, I can answer that. Those okay. please my parents. Yeah, okay. Because the, you know, the scripture does say honor your mother and father. Right. So even if my mom and dad were like, yo, we're going to hang a tree from the ground and light it on fire and that will be your ceremony. Even though I don't find that to be true, I'm honoring my mother and father to, yeah, okay, to the sacrament okay, okay. that they want. Well, you can imagine that there's multiple reasons. But my mother always taught me to love God more than her. So I have no problem denying her will if it's under God's will, right? So like if God says do something and my mom says do something, my mom has trained me to be a man, to look at my mother as the foolest woman she is in that moment and to lean on God's understanding, not my mother's understanding. So what I want to ask from you is whose understanding is the truth? Is it my mother's understanding of I need a, a priest to ordain this and to make it finalized or do I lean on what I'm reading in the scripture? But again, I'm 31. Yeah, I'm sitting on a camera and I'm explaining. Bro, I'm pretty, maybe I'm wrong, bro. I've been out of religion a long time, but I feel like scripture says don't fuck pussy, bro, until you're married, doesn't it? I don't know. I'm Catholic. I grew up Catholic. I don't know. My deepest thoughts and people are following and they're, and they're thinking I'm wise. I'm not wise. I don't tell people, I tell people this. I'm not a preacher. I'm a man who fears God and loves to talk about it. So my fear is that when I say something like this and another man out in, in Ohio is like, yeah, I feel the same. And then he goes that direction. Well, then it's well, better. Well, okay. I would say that to some degree, you're falling prey to the same, te same temptation that I heard many young men, for example, in my clinical practice, tell me in relationship to marriage. They would say, why do I need a piece of paper? Like, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I'm married. Right? Now, their partner didn't always agree with that sentiment. In fact, generally- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is he so afraid to marry her, K.O. says. Yeah, 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 George. If you're already married to her, then get married. That's what I'm saying. Y'all are pussies, bro. I married the fuck out of my secular ass husband right away. I put a ring on that bitch. I was like, you're my bitch now, bitch. He can't even put a ring on his bitch, bitch. He can't even marry her, bitch. Girl, how much you love this woman? Not enough. That's why I'm saying, like, I look at people that are like, we've been engaged seven years. And I'm like, why? Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There are exceptions. And I see you guys. I see the bubble. I get it. There could be exceptions. But in this, in this bubble, what's the reason? What's the reason you ain't putting a ring on it? What's the reason, bro? You're already putting your dick on it. And that's generally the case with women. But their claim would be, mm. well, my heart's already in it. And I think the proper objection to that, and I think you've already touched on that by the, this proper objection, is that marriage is not only a private and subjectively <sighs> defined state, no more than identity. As you know, in our culture, we clamor to insist that I am whoever I say I am. Well, you're not. Your 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 identity is negotiated with other people, and a marriage is also not only private. It's also the bedrock of society as such, but it's also an institution that, even in the personal case of you two, will have a branching effect on many, many other people: your parents, your siblings, your children, your cousins, the people who watch you. And so, that part of it, your commitment to the social part of your marriage, which would include the honoring of your parents, that's also important. You, we, there's a reason that since time immemorial, people stand in front of their community and make their vow. Now, it, it also may be that, as far as you're concerned, you know, your heart's thoroughly into this, but your marriage is going to go like this, you know, mm -hmm. and the down times where you might be tempted to stray, you may need every bit of reinforcement against that string. Yo, your marriage is going to go up and down. My marriage is going to go back and forth, baby. <laughs> Let's go. We're going to make that bed squeak. I don't like that narrative that like our marriage is going to go up and down. My parents' marriages never went up and down. Life went up and down, but the marriage never did. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why you want to fuck strange, bro? When you can just like actually bond with someone, you feel me? 
Maiden says, I'm pretty sure after thinking about it, about that, I'm not in the marriage bubble. The institution is not important to me personally. And I never have been one to participate in things that don't ring true. Fair. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. Fair. Accessible to you. And one of those means of reinforcement is, well, you didn't just tell her. You told her and everyone else publicly that this was. He just told all of us. He wants to fuck her, but not marry her. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Your decision. And that but I already did that. I already did it. It's already public. That's the, that's yes. the thing that I'm wrestling well, with. Well, my, my wrestling is even if she herself, the one that I look at and now I see as one, my, my covenant, right? If yeah. she's like, I want to get married. Yeah. I'm not wrestling with if I want to please her or please my parents. It's the thing that we were saying, the truth, right? If everybody here says, no, George, this is what had to do, it's meaningless to me what they feel if it goes against what my Christ feels. So Jesus is telling you not to get married? Per quoi? So I'm trying to see what is your thoughts in the Bible? Well, does why it not say? bring it all together? Never thought of it that way. You know, I mean, you know, fair enough. I'm so but... worried. I'm, I'm like tunnel vision because every what? time I widen my perspective and I lean on what they would like, it always ends up. Oh, I up... see the problem. Oh, I see. Well, no, 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 no. Okay, that's, that's okay. I see. No, that's a reasonable objection. But look, imagine you're looking for the optimized solution. Yeah. Okay, then bring everything together. Yeah. Right. So what you're saying is you don't want to sacrifice, at least to some degree, you don't want to sacrifice your like intense preoccupation with leading an appropriate and godly life. You don't want to sacrifice that even to consensus. Not even for well, a little bit. Well, then don't sacrifice it. Bring it, bring them together. Make the consensus work in, in the same direction. Well, that's what a good, look, if you have a good marriage day, that's what'll happen. Mm. Like, and so I can tell you how to do that. I had a good marriage day and, and I've officiated at a number of weddings and I've seen ones go well and badly. It, what to do at a wedding is quite straightforward, is invite the people you want and maybe even some of the people you don't want that your parents want, right? <laughs> because, them. Well, right, because that's part of... Because it's bring, their son. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You bring, you bring your community around you and you're hospitable to them, so they're welcome. You, you, you lay out your vows in good faith. You feed them, they dance, they get a chance to see each other. It's a celebration. The union and, of both your communities, right? Yeah, so the yeah. union of my community and his community so that we could all be... What? To evaluate, that's right, to, to evaluate each other to some degree and to see, you know, I went to one wedding, for example, that was just a complete bloody catastrophe. It was absolutely obvious to everyone. Wait, Caitlin said, to be fair, he literally said the Bible doesn't say you have to be married by a minister or whatever, that the fact the father's blessing is what counts. Um, yeah, I don't trust George's reading of the Bible or scripture. You feel me? It's about... Because, like, if, if it's, it's also about proclaiming her and proclaiming the Lord yours, like, I'm pretty sure the Lord doesn't give a fuck if you proclaim that, you know, the Lord is hit, like, yours and still does shit that the Lord's like, hey, don't do that, bro. Same thing with, like, the marriage. I'm not sure that I trust George's interpretation, but then I don't trust any modern Christian's interpretation of the Bible. I mean, fuck the Bible, bro. The Bible came 300 years after these bitches be dead. So, like, I don't even trust nobody anyways. It's all man-made. It's all a construct. I'm just saying... Your construct seems a little picky choosy, which is fine, which says to me it's not real. That's what I mean. Everybody be like, God is objective. Well, for something so objective, y'all pick and choose every fucking day. For something so real and objective, y'all play fucking fire with God, bro. Look at him playing chicken with God. Can you imagine telling yourself, I actually believe in a God, but I'll play chicken with him? That's wild, bro. One there that the wedding was going to that the marriage was a complete sham and that there wasn't a possibility that this, that this uh, coupling was going to survive. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Political Observer says I just got here from when I'm understanding this guy wants to fuck her and have a way out, but delude her into the charade or uh, charade that he's, his feelings are marriage enough, bro. He's like, look, baby, I love you so much, baby. God is with us. Now let me into that pussy, bruh. He's like, baby, why do we even need to get married, baby? Baby, I read the Bible, baby. It didn't even say we need to be married, baby. Baby, I don't even got to marry you to fuck you, according to Jesus, baby. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's like, baby, baby, baby. <laughs> George kind of a fuck boy, bro. That would be a good example of, in some ways, the false consensus that you just described. Because it was obvious, in this case, that the groom was completely uncommitted to the process. It was just show. It was so blatantly obvious. Mm -hmm. It was really quite ugly. And so that would be the ultimate example of the thing that you were concerned about, where there was no real commitment on the part of the participants, and there was just Ooh. the social show. But there's no reason you can't have your cake and eat it, too, at oh. a wedding. You can bring everyone together in the proper spirit while you're aligned with the proper spirit. And then Should I feel guilty having right. sex before, or should I nip it in the butt? What, what would an honorable man of God do? 
if he knows in his heart. Why are you asking Jordan, dude? Ask a priest. Ask a pastor. Ask a fucking... Why are you asking Jordan Peterson? He's a no. I feel like this is my wife, but now I'm playing the game of, like, I have to wait until she's well, my wife in public. Well, okay, like, I would say two things about that. The first is you could experiment and find out. Two things. There's two approaches. You could experiment and find out because you might want to find out given that you've already played to some degree with abstinence and found it useful under circum some circumstances. You might want to play with that and see where that goes hmm. because you don't know. It might be better for both of you if you didn't have sex before you were married. Now, I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm all, I am saying that you don't know if that's the case. Yeah. Like it might be the kind of sacrificial offering that cements your marriage in place. Who knows? But it who might... am I sacrificing it for? My parents or God? Because if I think I that know. God sees it in... What? In a way that all I need is the permission of the Father, then I don't care to play the well, dance that's why with I other said people. Well, that's why I said you could experiment, because you could find out that way. I guess that I see this way in, in the same way of baptism, right? And oh my God, this might piss a lot of people off, but hey. Uh, baptism. I was baptized as a baby. But then I read the Bible and this is baptism is like a proposal and it's like a marriage and it's a covenant before God. So mm -hmm. my mother arranged that without my permission nor my heart. Yeah. So is that meaningless? So now when I have... I don't, think, I don't think it's meaningless, but it is missing something that you're pointing to. It's not... Me well, that's why Catholics have confirmation when you're a teenager. So you can confirm again, which is still an issue because you're still a teenager. In the Assyrian church, they do confirmation as like kids sometimes. So like it depends, but that's the idea of confirmation. But then I've been baptized. Do you guys know? Can I tell you? This is okay. So uh, we have a family friend who's a, a like basically like a lawyer of the church. He's like he knows the church law. Okay, that's what he does. He's a priest. And basically, because I'm baptized and confirmed, but I married a non-baptized, non-confirmed person, we can get a special blessing that says we have intentions to walk with Christ or intentions to walk in the way of Christ that will allow us to be seen as married enough for my parents to validate the marriage and my farm brother to host us as a host. But because I am baptized in confirmed, they can validate the marriage in a religious or unreligious sense in a way because I am a Catholic, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. That's why they that's how they get you, right? Um, that's how they get you. I am a greater s possibility of sin because I know Christ and I've turned my back on him. But because my husband has never known Christ, he's held to a different standard because I've known Christ and I decided to be an atheist. You know what I mean? It's like very interesting. It's like very funny. You're like, so it's all like a game. Um, yeah, that's kind of funny. Catholicism isn't Christianity. Um, it's the universal church girl. Jesus in the name girl. What do you mean? Meaningless because it was part of a ceremony for your mother, right? Mm -hmm. And it was part of her hopes for your future. It's part of the family lore. You know this happened. It's a way that you were brought into the community technically. It sets a pattern, but then it's missing what you're pointing to is something that's missing, which Love. is that, well, that no, it's more voluntary conscious participation, right? And so there's an element, there's certainly an element of baptism Bad. that you could point to that's quite concrete, that's a matter of making the decision to open yourself up to the pathway of God, because that's what you're doing when you're baptized, right? So I'll tell you something about baptism that's quite interesting. So when Christ is baptized in the Gospels, it's right before he goes into the desert. Mm -hmm. Before right. you well, fast that, well that's partly because when you open yourself up to the descent of the Holy Spirit, so to speak, when you open yourself up to God, one of the first things that will make itself manifest is all the ways that you're not there, right? That's the same as the desert. Hmm. Now, it's not by fluke, by the way, so the story continues, right? Because Christ is in the desert for 40 days, and that's where he meets Satan himself. He gets tempted. Well, and so what happens is that if you, once you orient yourself upward, once you allow yourself, once you open yourself up to that possibility, the desert makes itself manifest, and if that's a form of, what would you say, that's a form of alienation from God, that's a good way of thinking about it, the ultimate extent, the ultimate manifestation of that is dwelling in the presence of Satan, and that's exactly what happens. And so what that means practically is that if you, once you orient yourself upward and you start to understand how you're lost, if you dig to the bottom of that, you'll find the author of all evil, right, dwelling within you. And so that's right, that's, that's true. So it's the same 
to tie this back to what we talked about earlier is when I was curious for, I'll tell you a story, so it's relevant to this. So when I was in Edmonton doing my first degree, I was about 20, 20, 21, something like that. And I had this professor, he's a very strange guy, adjunct professor, so he wasn't a full-time professor at the university, he was a part-time uh, specialist they brought in. He was the prison psychologist at the Edmonton Maximum Security Prison. And the Edmonton Maximum Security Prison was a bad place. It was full of, like, monstrous people. Mm. And uh, he took me out there a couple of times. And uh, one of the times, the first time I really remember, I was in, he left me in the gym with these guys, and they were all, like, weightlifting monsters and scarred up, and they all surrounded me and offered to trade. I had a kind of a fancy coat on, a, like a cloak and they asked me to trade clothing with them and he had vanished somewhere I was surrounded by these like monstrous characters and <laughs> and so that was rather unsettled but then what did you when, say to them when they asked you to take yeah, clothes they, well yeah, I right, wanted yeah. to ask but <laughs> I wanted to interrupt of course, that's exactly the, the question I you know I, I actually don't remember um I think what I did was tell them the truth which is what you should always do in a situation like that like if you're dealing with if you're on very very shaky ground mm -hmm. that's when it's very important to be very humble and do nothing but tell the truth. And that's especially true if you're dealing with dangerous people, especially if they're paranoid. Mm. Because if you, if they're suspicious of you and you lie, it's over. You, you are in such trouble. Pa paranoid people, Jordan would know he's one of them. Anyways, this little guy came out and uh, came into the group where I was and he told me that the psychologist had asked him to, for, for, for me to accompany him, this guy that came up. And it was just a little kind of not unpre- Okay, do we, this feels like, I don't care about this part. I just wanted to know about the relationship part. Um, he goes on, the timestamp says, how do you pray? And can the devil hear your thoughts? Like, this is such a religious, like, religious interview. Jordan Peterson is not religious. I feel like George doesn't realize that. Like, Jordan Peterson is not religious. You know, like, his wife is going through a religious journey, but Jordan has not declared a religious journey. I don't know why people don't understand that. Like, yes, he is more right-winged and he is more open to Christ, but he is not on your side yet. All these Christians and Catholics are like, Jordan's going to be on our team. Relax. Okay, this is what I wanted to watch. I was curious on that clip that I saw about why would Jordan Peterson be anti-premarital sex. Now, I will say he's not obviously anti-premarital sex, but he's anti-casual -ca sex, which I think is fair. You know, Look, I personally do think there's a destructive way, of course, to do everything. I'm not a fan of hedonism. I know people think there's only two rules, right? Right? There's only two things that that counts. You know, either you're, um, um, no, well, hold on. Rashad in the chat says he converted to Christianity recently. Well, he full on denounced God in this light, I doubt. Well, it couldn't have been this stream then. This is a day old. He couldn't have converted because he's literally denying Christ. He's in no way claiming Christ in this whole podcast. Hold on. Jordan Peterson Christian. I even heard this. Why did you become a Christian? This is 2023. He's not. That's not for him. Proclaims the deep principle of Christianity, but he's not saying he's a Christian. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing it that he. Where'd you see that? Because in this podcast alone, he was literally so confused why he was being asked these questions. Yeah, Jordan is the brand. I act as if God exists. Yeah, he acts as if God is real. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I just haven't seen anything official. Um, but either way, wait, hold on. Um, oh, fuck, I lost my train of thought. I blame you, Rashad. Go see our collab. It was really good. Rashad and I had a good conversation yesterday. What was I saying? Was it profound? <laughs> oh, premarital sex. For the record, I am anti-hedonism. Okay? I think it lacks discipline. I'm also anti-paranoid restriction. Right? Restricting yourself out of fear. Restricting yourself out of discipline is not the same thing. Okay? So, again, you know, fucking 20 people a night, probably not a good idea, guys. I'm just going to say it. Probably not a good idea. Again, you want to be healthy. And healthy can look like many things. The problem with the world is that it's convinced itself that healthy only looks two ways. Either no rules and no structure and no discipline or all the rules, all the structure and the discipline. Right? And I just feel like there's so much more nuanced. There's so much more nuance. Stuff.
my head and real are falling dead my belly's being fed and i'm okay i'm just fine yet all i do is whine not to you in my mind cause i know i don't make sense i've been nothing but blessed so why's my life a mess please tell me cause i'm sick of thinking yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.